Hello and welcome back to day 54 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So um, I am back one day earlier than anticipated because I've been kind of feeling um, a little more motivated uh, after uh, you know, having a nice relaxing time at my uh, at uh, my family's house here in Denmark. Um, so expect that there may be more videos than usual uh in this month but uh maybe some weeks we'll have none if i'm traveling uh, somewhere else but uh i guess expect a little more irregular schedule maybe some weeks have more videos and others have fewer but um and this week i'm going to try to to cram in a bunch of stuff since um i'm kind of feeling motivated so um first a quick follow-up item on uh last stream uh I don't know if anyone remembers, but um, there were some off by one kind of things where certain outputs from modules being tested weren't showing up early. Um, and that actually turned out to be a bug. Um, and I've done some, um, let's see, now it, it won't necessarily be visible now because I changed how tick works a little bit. But basically previously what we were doing is when we were testing stuff, we were um, we were only updating I think after tick but but not before tick or maybe it was before tick but not after tick. Anyway, there was only one of the two, and the effect of that was at, oh yeah it was before. So we were doing we were previously doing this, which meant that um, the register next ports had up to date values when the tick was uh, was executed, which is correct which means that all the registers are updated with the up-to-date values as defined by the circuits, uh, dependent on the inputs that the testing module or the tester provides. Um, but then after the tick, we weren't updating the outputs of the module um, before calling back into the tester, which means the tester was always running on kind of out-to-date, um, out-of-date uh, output values by one cycle. So you actually have to do the update both before and after. And that made me realize that um, if you do that, you can actually profitably split the update style logic into two parts, one which only computes um, up-to-date values for the registers and one which computes up-to-date values for the outputs. And so now if you look at, um, the code is a little bit messy because it means that I don't have to exit, I have to emit uh, instructions in two contexts, one's for, one for update and one for tech. But um, let me show you what the code looks like when you emit it. Um, oh, right. I guess I removed this um, function because it was actually a no op, I believe. Okay, I probably shouldn't have removed that function, even though it was temporarily no op. Um, let me see if I can undo it. I can't remember if it's the most recent. Okay, I had it right here. I was let's just leave it like that because there's some code that was dependent on it. Um, all right, and then let's go back to code locals. Let's show you what the emitted code looks like right now. So. Um, you still have update, and update computes up-to-date output values. So if you look at the end of update, it should have some stuff related to, uh, well, I guess that's the divider, maybe. Uh, yeah, let's take this one. Uh, sim I'm trying to remember, what is this? Is this the counter? All oh, right, this is the this is the conditional counter. So let's look at this one. This was the the multiplier. So the two outputs in this case are p and p valid. And if you look at update, you can see it computes p and it computes p valid. So the update function basically does the same thing it did back in the days of purely combinational modules, and it, it computes up to date outputs. Um, previously, yesterday uh, when we added registers, update also computed up to date values for the register next inputs, which are used to, you have to update those before you can tick the registers and advance them to their next state. Um, but 
this meant that you basically, first off, I had that bug that I mentioned, but even after quote unquote fixing the bug, I was calling update twice. Uh, and only one of them was necessary for each because like in one case you only care about the the inputs to those registers in the other case you only care about the outputs from the module as a whole and so i split uh, i split the code into two sections basically uh this here only computes the output same as before and this here only computes the uh the new register values and ticks them at the same time so it actually ended up simplifying some of the code there's no r underscore next uh outputs to compute that are then uh, set in a tick function. So previously, the tick function basically only did a set of the register state values, um, but now it also computes the up-to-date inputs to the registers that are used to define the next state. So anyway, um, this was this both fixed a bug, kind of. I mean, you could you could get the old code to work by just calling update twice, once before and once after tick, but um, this is also more efficient. Um, there are some cases where there can be overlap between the code computed and uh, between the, the circuit that's uh, uh, simulated and updated in tick. Um, but uh, anyway, with the old approach, it would be 100% overlap, essentially. It didn't try to disentangle those two parts. And what you'll often find is that if the circuit you're trying to simulate has what are, what are called registered outputs, if the outputs are just copies of internal registers like it, they are here, then the the update code will always be very simple because it will basically just copy out the current values of certain registers to outputs. Um, so like in this case here, it's reading X and Y, which are registers, um, and it's just copying them to you know corresponding named outputs. So if you're if you're using registered outputs, which is very common, then the update function becomes essentially trivial. It's just copying internal register values to named outputs and tick becomes the real workhorse because it has to figure out how to set the next register values. Um, anyway, uh, so that was just a follow up and, and the way that code is done, I'm probably going to clean up because it was sort of jammed in trying to reuse a bunch of existing codes. It's a little bit nasty in the way that it repurposes the existing uh, code for emitting, um, emitting instructions because now there's sort of two sets of instructions we have to, uh, to emit. And basically the way it works is <clears throat> you have the normal code that only computes outputs and then there's a separate linearizer invoked to compute things that um, drive you know next like the the register inputs uh, to these next ports um, and uh, you get a, another set of instructions for that so this is what you put in the tick function anyway uh, just to follow up on that note um, so anyway, today I just plan to continue with other fun stuff and um, to quickly move on to pipelining, basically, uh, combinational pipelining. Um, but anyway, one, one practical uh, change from this is that we had a bunch of, I think yesterday because of that we weird um, sort of delay, output delay issue because of the way we're not updating things, there, I had additional yields uh, which are no longer needed. Um, so now it's... Uh, the code is kind of what you'd expect. So for this test uh, harness, you can see we set the inputs we want to submit, we yield in order to submit them, and then subsequently we set enable to zero, and then we just spin until p valid is true. So this is kind of exactly, there's there's not, no extraneous yields now. Um, so this is good, this is correct. All right, uh, you can see this should still work. Let me just remove that print code stuff. So yeah, all these these tests pass now. Still have the old stuff as well. All right. Um, let's see. Um, I plan to just do. Uh, I plan to talk about pipelining now. Um, in the simple case, which is purely feed-forward pipelining, um, or at least where a certain part of the circuit is purely feed-forward, which is usually what happens with pipelining. Um, so-called combinational pipelining, where really all you're doing is you're taking what we were previously doing, like a combinational circuit, like a multiplier maybe, and you're inserting certain registers that feed forward. Uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce a shorthand for that uh, immediately. So um, one very common... Uh, like I said, one, one very common use of registers is so-called feedforward registers or delay registers or pipeline registers. And that's a case where all you're really doing is you're trying to uh, 
um, make you know the next value of a register be some combinational thing. Um, but it doesn't. But but the next value of the register doesn't depend on the previous value of itself. So previously, when we we're doing things like counters, you know, we would have um, you know we we would have something like this, and uh, here the next uh, the next input of that register depends on the the old value. Um, so this is very common with state machines and stuff like this, but there's another very common use case, which is much simpler um, and deserves to be treated with a slightly different approach because it's much more amenable to sort of algebraic thinking. And um, that's when, when things are feed forward. So for example, um, you just have a value here and you have some other value Y, and really all you're doing here is your X is, is the delayed value of Y. So in the next tick, uh, X's value will be what Y's value was in the previous tick. So you're just delaying the value by by one cycle of what Y would be. Um, but this turns out to be a very useful primitive. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a simple constructor function for constructing feed forward register chains. Um, and it goes as follows. Normally when you construct a register, you, sp you have to specify the type up front. Um, so like the in the counter I did this and then I have to define the next port um, we can't do something like this um, because I mean aside from the fact that it just isn't valid Python on a superficial level um, it's not clear what the type would be right like how would it know what the type is you have to somehow tell it what the type is it can't infer it when it's circular like this we have type inference, but that only really works when things are feed forward. If I know what X's type is and I know what Y's type is, I know what X plus Y's type is. But if I say X is equal to X plus one, I can't infer the type from that. Like maybe I can say it's some sort of number like thing because I'm adding to it, but I certainly don't know the bid width, right? So, um, but when you're doing feed forward stuff, you can infer the type. And so rather than specifying the type, we just grab the type from a node that's passed in. That's kind of the idea. So, um, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a function called delay and it's going to basically construct a chain of registers uh, but quite often just one register and uh, we start by doing a normal idempotent conversion thing here um, and then I'm going to um, do the following um, I'm, I'm going to call a, memor a memorized function um, like this, um, where you just pass, you know, you just basically wrap the initial node in count versions of delay memo. And so delay memo is going to be a memorizing constructor function. And it assumes you're already, it's not going to do this sort of stuff here. It's already, it assumes it has already been done. So this is sort of an internal function that you're not supposed to use. Um, and what this is going to do is it's, um, is going to just construct a register with the type that's given by the node, and it's just going to say the the next of that register is just node. That's it. So it's very simple. It's just constructing a register, but um, node is already defined by the time it comes in here, so we can grab its we can grab its type. So you cannot use this directly to construct feedback, uh, you know, state machine type things. But it works great for, um, like I said, for um, for feed forward uses of registers. And, um, okay. So let me show you kind of a boring example of it, which doesn't really show you why you would use them, but it shows you how it works. Um, so let's do a new example. Um, I'm just going to have a, you know, an input, and then I'm going to have an output. And it will just be the delayed version of the input. So literally just delaying the input. Here we're using the default count of one, which is normally what you want, but you can also specify any value. Um, you can say I want to delay this 10 cycles, in which case it's going to construct a chain of 10 delay registers. Um, the common case is one, but um, anyway. Um, so we're going to do it like this. And uh, let me just show you that what it does, it, it shouldn't be a big surprise given the code I just wrote down. Uh, 
I guess I rebooted my computer. Right. So you can see purely feed forward, X comes in, this drives the next input of a register, and then the current value of that register is the output. So um, in cycle zero, um, this thing will have whatever default value the register does at reset, so th that will be zero. Um, and then subsequently, the output will always be the value of the input in the previous cycle. Um, so let's just verify. Um, that that is the case. So um, um, so in cycle number one, well, let's see. Um, in every cycle, we submit this, and then we yield, and then we assert that y equals x, because we've waited one cycle, and then we basically just check that the same thing comes out that we put in the previous cycle. I think that should be it. Um, something like this. Yeah, that seemed to work. Let me just make sure this stuff is actually executing. Okay, it's executing. Let me also suppress the spammy stuff here. Yeah, we're done with these examples. Let's just calm them out. Um, actually, I forgot to post to Twitter that I was going live. Let me just uh, do that. All right. So, um, so yeah, anyway, um, So this is just delayed if, um, anyway, yeah. So this is, this is what delay is. Um, one thing that's very nice about this is that, um, you know, compared to other ways of instantiating registers, you don't have to first instantiate it, specify the type, and then hook it up. You can just kind of use it like an operator, the way you use plus and, you know, XOR and other things. And that will turn out to be very useful. Um, because it satisfies a bunch of useful algebraic laws, like for example, uh, this is true, um, stuff like that. Um, essentially, this is because the operator plus is time independent, and so uh, if if you're doing something like, you know, well, this is true for plus. If you're doing something like, suppose you have some general function uh, of two va values. Um, it's not necessarily the case that uh, uh, yeah, it has to be time independent f. So obviously addition is time independent, but suppose f was something that depends on the current state of something else that's implicit, then this is not necessarily true. Um, but in many cases, when you're dealing with mathematical things, for example, uh, you're dealing with time-independent operators, um, then this will be true. And um, you also have this very useful identity um, uh, if A is constant. So if, um, if you take something that's actually constant, then delaying it doesn't change its value. It's always just the same over time. So shifting it by one cycle doesn't really do anything. The one caveat with that is in, in the very first cycle, um,
yeah, you have to be careful about when the system gets reset. So if there's a delay, then the first value of that delayed thing is going to be whatever the reset value is. Um, so this is only true kind of once you've gone past the, the, the reset warm-up period. Um, but in many cases, that's, um, that's not an issue. Like in, in, specifically with feed forward circuits, they forget about their initial conditions very quickly uh, once the, the maximum history or the maximum memory. Like if, if you're looking at most three cycles back in the past, so the largest thing you're doing is delay, delay, delay X, then after three cycles past reset, you've forgotten about the initial conditions and, and this holds true from then on. So, but, but there is that annoying spatial case for uh, right after reset when you're dealing with these sort of identities uh, here. And that's true for all of these, uh, actually, is that um, all of these are only true after reset. Um, if you're dealing with things in a mathematical context, sometimes you prefer to treat the signals as if they have no beginning of time, like they are infinite, both going forward and backward, and then these are exactly true. But uh, in the absence of that, you have to worry about those initial conditions. Um, So anyway, um, okay, let me show you how using delay, we can start to pipeline stuff. Um, and actually, I just realized one thing we should do is we should go and uh, we have our delay analysis. Um, and now that we're dealing with uh, sequential logic, one thing you want to, um, sorry, my, my chair is giving me issues. Uh, one thing you want to do is you want to augment your delay analysis to compute um, critical paths going between registers. So previously, our, our, crit, our critical paths were only for external inputs and external outputs. So for every external output, we want to find the critical path to each of the external inputs. Once you add registers into the system, um, you have to consider internal paths between registers. So for every register input that defines the next value, what is the critical path to other uh, register outputs that feed into it? Um, so uh, I think that's going to be pretty easy to um, to accommodate. I want to put that in now because when we're doing pipelining, the main thing we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the, the length of the critical path, the, the delay on the critical path from one register to another register, ultimately from an input to an output perhaps as well. Uh, and so I want to show you sort of quantitatively, even though we have this mock model of delays is not necessarily calibrated to real values, you should at least be able to see those values go down once we start to insert pipeline stages. So um, let's just quickly go back and look at this stuff here. I think what we want to do is um, let's see. Um, okay, when we encounter a register, um, first off, you just, same as when we encounter an input, um, hmm. registers right now are not uniquely identified by a name. They're just have an identity. So that might be a little bit annoying. Um, let me just think about that. So, let's turn this back. I don't know why I decided to go with names. Maybe because they have external meaning, um, but I don't think that's really necessary. Um, I think none of this logic really cares about, well, oh, I guess it's because of this connection stuff. When you're dealing with submodules, you recursively do that. Um, let me just think about if there's an easy way. Mm. 
analyze the hmm. So well, what do we output? We output dictionary that maps from the output names to the dictionary, which associates each input name with its corresponding path, maximum path, the path delays of that output. Um, and so that's really the thing we care about here. Um, Um, let me first, uh, let's forget about registers for a second, just refactor it a little bit. Let's move this to being like that. Um, but then here I will be like, this is the port. Um, and this would be like the port dot name. Um, because otherwise I don't think stuff really has otherwise it doesn't really have to change module outputs so I, mean, I guess you can just do this maybe okay slight sidebar uh, as I work this out let's see if our code for that still works probably doesn't oh yeah it ends up Printing the entire freaking thing. Um, it's not really, maybe that's why I decided to present it using the name so you don't get this recursive wrapper junk. Um, weren't really using these anyway. Um, you can't really. to step all of them up because we're not using them anyway. I want the types to have something else, but let's just make these completely opaque except for the name of the class. Um, for constants, I guess that's fine. For names, yeah, let's keep those names. So that's something we probably want to see here. But that's fine too. Um, all right. I think that's it. Okay. All right, so this is what we had before, but um, using nodes rather than node names. Not, not a big improvement. Um, all right, I guess um, I think what I want to do now is I 
when we're doing this a delay analysis, we don't really care about the register delays for the submodule. We only care about, um, or maybe we do. You know what? Let's just leave this for now. I think um, we don't really need this for the pipelining. I can just explain it, uh, why it's better, and showing you in the graph. Um, all right. Let's do a pipeline multiplier or something like that. Um, so uh, here is just a simple delay register. Now let me show you um, a really, well, I guess we already have it. Um, i trying to remember what we did for our first naive multiplier. Right, so here we, uh, we generated all the partial products and then we added them in parallel. Let's do something that's even dumber, which I think we never did because it's not really something you typically do in hardware. We already have our bit serial uh, multiplier. Let me now do a sort of dumb combinational multiplier. And basically what we're going to do is um, um, let's see. We have a product and we start with X and then We iterate over the bits of, well, let's see, how do you want to put it? We could do something like this. Um, um, let's see, basically the same thing we were doing up there. Okay, so why is the thing we were accumulating? Um, when x I mean let's see when x zero then y l zero and then for each of these successive iterations we we do this shift um, and we look at the same thing. Let me return p. So this is basically like our bit serial multiplier, but combinational. So it's done all in a single cycle. But this is not a good way of doing multiplication in hardware. That's why I didn't even explore it as a stepping stone when we covered multipliers earlier, because it's uh, it, it doesn't really expose the parallelism between adding the partial products, but it's the same idea. But um, let's use this formulation for now. Um, and so, so we have sort of a before and after. Let me just, even though this is very basic, let me just write the test case for this to mirror the other multiplication test cases. Um, and then I'll show you how easy it is to pipeline this with. Uh, with the use of delay. So um, compile it, and then we do our usual brute force test. And so we say evaluate, um, evaluate um, x, y, get p back. And then we assert that this is equal to x times y masked. So let's just check that this still works. Okay, that's presumably executed. Um, so really dumb multiplier, so dumb that you generally don't want to consider it in this form. But um, now let me show you how to pipeline it. Um, It's going to be basically the same code. I'm going to make a slight modification. First, I'm going to write these, you know, without these in place uh, rotation. So these get shifted over. And I'm going to write this as P plus. So, so far it's the same thing, um, right? Same thing as, as before. But now what I'm going to do is at every one, at every one of these stages, I'm going to wrap them in delay. And that's it.
That's literally the only change. So it's the same, if you think of this as being a round, this is a, an iterative process or, uh, you know, it's not operating in place the way a serial iteration thing would do, but it's, you know, the, the structure is iterative. It's doing the same thing in a number of successive rounds. Really all we're doing is we're adding delays between the rounds. When we do this, it's very important that all the, all the pieces of state that we're threading through, namely X, Y, and P, uh, because in this case, X becomes state, in fact, uh, it's very important that all of them get delayed so that they are kind of in phase. Um, but anyway, let me show you that this works. Hopefully it works. And then I'll maybe talk about kind of explaining it if it doesn't make sense at first glance. But this is kind of the magic of working with the delay operator as opposed to explicitly instantiated delay registers. Um, let's see. That's it. Um, Now the test is going to be a little bit interesting because um, when we did the bit serial multiplier and we were testing that, we first off you can still do that. So maybe let me show you two ways of testing it. One one which doesn't really exploit the pipelining um, and hence kind of defeats the point, but uh, nevertheless works. Um, and tests that at least when there's only one thing flowing through the pipeline at once, it will give the right result on the other end. Um, so, um, let's see. Uh, note that there's no enable signal right now. So actually, let's let's add that just for parity, and it will turn out that'll be useful. So uh, one thing you can do is sort of similar to the um, I'll actually call it valid here, um, which is a name we'll be using going forward. And now the interpretation is rather than thinking of this as being kind of an enable signal, like a control signal, it's, it, you can think of it as a control signal, but basically the point is that it, it's, just as is previously, we had P and P valid, and on the output side, P said P is a valid thing, and so you can make sense of it. Here, we're using it on the input side, and it means X and Y are valid, you should multiply them. Um, so we're going to do that, and then we are going to um, actually return two things rather than just one, and it's going to be P and P valid, and then I'm, I have to wrap them in outputs um, like that. So, yeah. Um, actually, let me just think. I think I already... If I don't, I should. Um, my output function should be able to map over tuples. Do I do that? Like, um, I'm trying to remember, I already do that for when. Let me just see what I do for when. Right, I want something similar here for output. Um, if x is a tuple, then I basically just want to um, map over the components. Um, so that if I do, the, the point then is I can do this, and uh, it will turn into two outputs. Uh, not, a, not a tuple output, but a, a, not an output tuple, but a tuple of outputs. I guess is what I'm doing there. But anyway, now let's put valid let's put valid through here. Um, and what's going to change is that we're going to return p and valid, but um, valid itself is going to be delayed. Maybe I'll we'll make this last the list. So the idea is we're always going to be multiplying stuff regardless of what's going on. But if x and y are not, you know. 
if they're not real values or whatever, they're just whatever happened to be asserted on those ports, then a, valid va uh, a value of zero for valid will propagate through the pipeline and will come out on the other side. So then even though this product is probably not useful for anything, you'll be able to tell by looking at valid. And conversely, if you submit a, uh, an input, um, you can tell when it's ready by, you know, it, it has FIFO behavior. The first thing I submit that has valid one will be the first thing to emit, uh, to emerge on the other side of the pipeline with a valid of one. Um, and so in order to ensure that we just have to, all these things we're kind of pushing down the pipeline, we just have to make sure they're always delayed by the same amount. And the easy way to do that is just to make sure that, you know, every one of them is, you know, like some of, some of them actually get work done as they're flowing through, but in the case of something like valid, it just passes through uh, untouched, but it nevertheless has to be delayed in order to stay in phase with its companion data. Okay, um, so let's try that. And I mean, we can call this enable if we want. And uh, actually, let's call it. And let's call it. Something like that. Um, then you have, all right. Dictionary change size during iteration. I guess that makes sense, actually. Let me just think for a sec. If it changes size during iteration, it would mean that new registers are discovered during iteration. So we probably need to do a fixed point loop here. Um, So initially there's zero of them. Actually, I guess we can just let's go do it like that. Okay. So, um, so first, let, like I said, let's do the test where um, we don't really uh, exploit the pipelining. We submit one input, and then before submitting anything else, we wait for the output to emerge. And so at this point, after we've submitted it, I'm going to set enable to zero. And then I'm going to say while not, basically the same thing we had before, while not self p valid yield. And then once we do get the result, I'm going to... Um, assert that it's equivalent to the expected result. Um, see if that works. Okay, I probably screwed up code here.
let's see. So registers is always link zero to begin with. No, I guess the problem here is before we've done the first round. Still doesn't work. So this should uh, always. Oh, that's not right. From the initial, Let's see, for the initial pass, we use the first linearizer set of registers. For the subsequent passes, we should use this one. So this one fills in the initial set. And subsequently, This is what we were doing before. Um, well, first I should figure this out properly. So I think the issue is basically so we do this initial round, and then subsequently we need, as long as we keep discovering registers, we need to add them to the dictionary. So
So at least making it to this point. Um, it's entirely possible the problem is just in the combinational multiplier. Like, um, we have the initial enable, then we just delay it. Um, you can actually just observe the pipeline. Um, and so let's see what self is now, since we yielded, uh, yeah, I should mention that I, I figured out one of the weird debugging issues we were noticing yesterday. It's because the debugger watch window is invoking the iter function for the, um, so we need later instance. So for now, let me just step that out. The stupid debugger behavior, unfortunately. Okay, so um, just be able to look at this. So enable is zero, but X should now be latched to the values we submitted. Well, I guess they were actually that. Um, let's do like two and four two and three or something like that just to make sure they're actually getting latched correctly so it's two and three uh, and then let's look at the next iteration they should have changed no I guess they really wouldn't um, some of these internal variables are changing Oh, so in this case, it actually did finish. Interesting. P valid was eight. How is that even possible? P valid should be a single bit. Maybe I just mistyped it. Doubt that's the issue, but okay, so that actually finishes. And it claims that P is zero. It's clearly incorrect. It should be six. There's even values that are six. Um Oh, I see the issue. The order I'm doing these iterations in is wrong. I have to be careful about that. Because I have to use the current values of x and y. One, one way you can express this so you're kind of immune to this stuff is you can do um, pxy or uh, you can kind of delay it as a tuple. Um, so you can say x, well, actually, before I do that, I need to implement a little converter for that anyway. But let me just put it originally. So uh, the problem is we were just assigning x and y before we were using the existing values. But maybe that, isn't that actually correct now that I think about it? Um, well. Let's do it really stupidly. No, let's do it like that. When x0, then y, so that's the initial value. I think that's what we did up here. Hmm. 
or delaying P valid. Okay. We're still getting this weird P valid equal 12 value. This is supposed to be a single bit. And so, must be doing something weird here. Let's check. So, enable is a single bit. Um, P valid is a single bit. It's still a single bit in length. And now it's P valid. P value, P valid is length one, then I really don't understand how in the heck it could come to the conclusion that its value could ever be something that's not a zero one value. be a compiler bug. So P value P valid is T seven, T seven is R eight. Um, all right, this does R8 occur? It's T24. It's totally bogus. This looks like uh, Y, not, it's not, not the right register. How's that confusion even possible? It must be something. Just to ensure it's nothing weird with uh, with the output tupling. Let's just try this. Well.
T38. And the off chance that it's related, let me just try something. Here. That's not the issue. <clears throat> The logic behind this when we are linearizing stuff we discover registers because we're dependent on them for the outputs but we don't as part of that traversal go into the next nodes of the register um, which is why when we do the subsequent pass, I think I know what the issue is. Oh my god. Um, yeah, I know what the issue is. This is really subtle. It's because the names collide. I'm using the names from, from one case here. So the names I get back, I actually straight up shouldn't use. Um, This thing also doesn't require making a copy of the list because we're operating on a different structure. Um, so we're visiting it with this. And we're not using the old name. Now here we're allowed to do this. Because it's names from within the same structure, so they're consistent. Okay, so ultimately what this structure is trying to say, this register's dictionary, is it wants to map from the names I guess that's not really this thing. Maybe this is what you do. So this simply adds it to the registered linearizers, let it list the registers, and then this is what really does the transitive closure of all these next things. So take everything that's reachable here. Visit it with this, which is going to assign it a name.
Actually, that's a problem. Because we need consistent names. We need consistent names. Fuck. We need consistent names between those two cases. So that's the issue. Because both the code and update and in tick needs to use the same names for the registers, and that's really that's where the failure was. So I, I think I see the issue now. But I wonder how to resolve it. The easiest thing to do is just to have a, a shared dictionary for registers. Um, and I mean, I guess one way of doing that is to it's hacky, but if you copy this over, um, copy this over to start the set. And so this is going to execute at least once because count starts it as none. And we go over everything that's in that list, which is initially what was carried over. Um, and this can create new registers if those registers are only reachable through another register. Um, okay, it still doesn't work. Fuck. Yeah, same. The problem, yeah, the problem is when it creates new registers, it's going to use the counter, uh, and so we need to clone the counter. Ah, okay. This is pretty, I, I'm going to have to think about the better way of doing that, which is clearly possible. But, um, yeah, actually, here's the better way of doing that. Um, you make a copy of this list of instructions, and then you set the old one. To empty, and then rather than creating a new linearizer, you just reuse the existing one. Um, I'll call this up the update instructions. Um, All these the tick instructions just to be very explicit. Let's order inputs, output registers, update instructions, tick instructions, input outputs, registers, update instructions. Tech instructions. Sometimes. It's not. Hopefully, for trivial reasons. So we reset the set of those instructions. We make a copy of it, this list at this point, and then we um, reset the list and start over again. Same set of registers though. And as long as this thing changes, basically. Like we make a copy of this before the loop and then we compare again after the loop, which means that if it's grown, um, we discovered more registers and we have to process them in another round. 
I guess rather than doing it in place, you could also just have a queue, but um, this is easier. <laughs> All right, this is clearly totally bogus. Um, actually, I know why you can't do this. Let me go back to the old one. It's because each of the visitors also has a dictionary, and we, we do have to visit things more than once, actually. So let me just go back to the stuff, even though it wasn't. I will think about better ways to do this. Okay. Now let's do the real test. It was aborted. Okay. One times one. We're getting two. It's interesting. Is not the correct answer, but um, let's print out a couple of things just to see if there's a pattern. If it's like off by one cycle or something like that. All of these are correct, which is commendable. Uh, one times one, one times two. So it's like two more than it should be, which indicates that one of the shifts is off. Let's verify that assumption by looking here. Let's see. How many partial products are there? Start with the first one. Maybe this order really was the correct one. Let's see. It's not. I mean, that does make sense because, let's see, I'm not really selling how simple this approach is, but I think it's something stupid I'm just overlooking. Um, start out with this partial product, and then in the next cycle, this is extremely long, warm here now. In the next cycle, we use the previous cycles, X, which is, yeah, that's not. So this part of it, I believe in. Much like this, the right thing up here. Um, this seems like one iteration too many, but yeah.
Now I guess I think I see the problem. Let me try to reformulate this algorithm as a parallel assignment. So then I'm going to say x, y, p, z, y. And if you do it like this, then I think you have to start with p equal to this, but then you have to also do it like that. Let me try that. We already have a test case for that old combinational multiplier, so let me just make sure I can get that to work. Right, combinational multiplier. Oh, P plus. Okay, so that works. Um, let me try just using the same formulation. The, the, the problem is I was mixing things from different times because I was not doing these assignments in parallel, and so it was confusing. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say P is going to be equal to, I mean, just to follow it exactly, it can be written more optimally. You don't need to have this zero. But um, you start out with this zero, and then you can do all of these parallel. Um, so x shifted over, y shifted over, p plus y zero, and p valid. Something like that. Too many values, right? We we didn't have that. Um, we need to define. Okay, it still doesn't work. Maybe because I don't have all the iterations required. Okay, now it works. It was just... Okay. Now the pipeline multiplier works. Um, the issue is just one of parallel assignment and me being stupid. And I was using a model that was serial with the ordering of those uh, shifts of those assignments. So uh, it's easier when you write it in parallel like this. Uh, and you can see now it's totally parallel, except everything, every iteration has been wrapped in delay, and p-valid is threaded through. But otherwise, it's the same code. That was <laughs> my original point, but um, got sidetracked by various bugs. So um, anyway, now we have a pipeline multiplier, but it's still uh, only feeding one thing through the pipeline at once. So if that's not what you want to do. It's it's a little bit harder to test this when it's pipeline because ideally you kind of want to have actually two different um, two different agents, I suppose. So maybe uh, like I kind of want to have one guy who's feeding the inputs and one guy who's consuming the outputs and checking the outputs are correct. So um, Maybe I will try to write that. So let's um, uh, let's try to expand our, our simulation test framework a little bit. So let's say what we do here is um, we're going to have a producer, and the producer is just going to feed inputs in this lexicographic order. And then once he's done, he's going to deassert enable, so he has no more things to feed. Uh, and then we're going to have a test consumer, which is going to, um, you know, they, they know what order of, 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 of submission is used for the operands. So this dude here is just going to say, while not um, self p valid yield 
and then once p is valid he will assert that self p is equal to the expected result <clears throat> now that we have this i think you need to be able to have more than more than one test i suppose And so now in for tester and testers, next tester, um, what I'm going to do is, I guess I'll say while testers actually, I can just do it like that. I have a set of guys, this is an ordered set, so it preserves the insertion order. Um, so we instantiate all of them pointing to the simulation so they can check, they can interact with it. And then every round we run all of them, but if any of them stops, then we simply um, remove them from uh, the set. Um, and I guess if that... I guess I have to do it separately after the iteration in order to do it in consistent order. Um, let's call it stopped. And then after this, I will say testers remove subtract. What is it called? Uh, stopped something like this first let me just make sure the existing test uh, the existing test run and let me make sure this stuff is actually executing okay so now we should be able to um, Do another simulation, but now here uh, with a producer and consumer running in parallel. Okay, that didn't work. It says P is valid. One one. See what comes out if it's just totally off. Or self B. I don't even know where that other P is coming from. Okay, so that's always zero. Interesting. You wait for P valid to become true. And then once it is true, P is always zero. <sighs> Let's see if there's anything stupid here I'm doing.
Let me just see what the pattern is in terms of the scheduling. It's like p-valid is always true, except shouldn't it at the very least wait one cycle? Oh, I see the issue. The issue is, okay, I think that's the issue. This is pretty trivial. Basically, I have to yield. Like once I see something, uh, Basically, he was consuming the same result over and over, which was zero, which happens to be zero times zero. So he has to, like, after consuming the result, he has to yield, because otherwise he's just spinning in the same cycle, checking the same thing over and over, even though he's assuming it's advanced, which is incorrect. Okay, let's see here. Okay, that works. Yay. Um. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not in a new place per se. I'm just visiting my family in Denmark, so um, at my mom's house. All right. Um, so this works. So here you can also see how it's useful to be able to run more than one test code routine at once. Because, for example, if you're trying to test a pipeline system like this, you want, for, for your own sanity, you want to be able to write the producer and consumer concurrently. Otherwise, you have to write your own crazy state machine uh, within, within a combined producer-consumer uh, system. Uh, if you wanted to decouple them further, so you, you could even have a queue that's sort of out of band where... Uh, there could be some shared data structure between the producer and consumer, like on the Python side, which says, hey, expect this result on your end or something like that. Um, in which case, he doesn't have to know even what to expect. He's just checking that the expected results are as specified. So like, um, show you what I mean. So this is not an efficient queue implementation, by the way. If I, I can never remember what Python does for that. Uh, Python 5.12. This is supposed to be used for multi-threading, but I guess it can be useful for uh, just if you want a normal data structure. So from Q import Q. Put. Um, then rather than being coupled to this, you can uh, I guess one thing that's annoying about this, well, as long as the producer always fills it first, but you can say while expected. Um, uh, expected values. Expected value, expected values.
Let's get, does that actually pop? Presumably. Okay. Um, See if that works. Interesting, why does this never even get to run? I wanted pause. Very strange. No idea why it's not pausing. Something about the queue because it's oh because it's a blocking queue. So when you get from an empty queue, I guess shit I can't remember. But if you use max size zero, it should just has to be something like that, right? Okay, so now it's working. I guess the issue could maybe just be that it's not. Yeah, it's still some weird behavior with the debugger or whatever. Anyway, let's go back to the old way. It's not super relevant. Uh, Okay, just to verify it actually executed. Okay. Um. Alrighty. So anyway, that works. Um, simple example of a pipeline system can be applied to pretty much everything. Um, we got so sidetracked with some of those weird, not really core issues and bugs. Um, let me see what we're doing on time. One hour and 40 minutes. Okay, let's do 20 minutes more on this general topic. And maybe I'll cut the stream and start recording again because I kind of want to do a two-parter with an extra at the end. Um, 
All right, so this works. Um, and I guess the lesson from this, which is something I said but should have heeded, is that you have to be very careful about keeping things in phase when you're doing this kind of stuff. Uh, otherwise, you end up mixing kind of registers or ver versions of values that are actually from different uh, slices of time. So the easiest way to keep things consistent is to identify all the state that moves forward as a unit like this and then specify kind of the synchronous transition the way I did it. So this is like the transition function. You just wrap it up in delay and call it a day. Um, and often you can have a kind of combinational counterpart. You can just wrap it in delays. So. All right, so we, we did finally get there, and you can see how simple it is in the end once we had all the stupid stuff debugged. Um, and the thing I want to, I guess, impress is that you can do this to any combinational circuit. You can, you can slice it at various levels and insert delays, um, and then you can add these valid signals that propagate through the pipeline with, along with all the data that's being processed. And... Uh, Basically, what you get out of that, I guess I didn't say that, but the reason you pipeline stuff is to make the circuit run faster. Um, it doesn't help the latency. From the time you submit the input to the time you eventually have the output, uh, in fact, it goes a little bit down because you're now dealing with the additional propagation delay of the flip-flops set up in hold time and so on, or a set up in clock to queue delays of, of, of your flip-flops that hold the pipeline state. But you can increase the throughput because you can submit um, like, for example, in the ideal case, let's say we start with this really, suppose this is like a 32-bit multiplier, uh, and the delay is evenly distributed across each of the bit slices. So there's 32-bit slices. Um, and now suppose we do what we did here, and in a simple world where we don't have to worry about the additional uh, slowdown from the pipeline registers themselves, and we can just assume that for now, uh, basically this the, the total delay from input to output goes down to one uh, 1 over 32 of what it was before, because now the delay you're worried about is from register slice to register slice, which in this case just corresponds to essentially an addition. That's going to be the critical path is this addition here. So r rather than having 32 additions with some shifts and stuff, you're now looking at a single addition per register slice, which can run you know roughly 32 times faster if you're trying to clock the circuit. Um, the latency from when you submit the input to when you uh, get the eventual output is not going to be faster. In fact, like I said, it's going to be a little bit slower because even though you're clocking the circuit 32 times faster, you now take 32 cycles to get the output. So you haven't made a gain in terms of latency, but the throughput has increased uh, because you can't submit something every cycle and you're working on a bunch of things in parallel throughout the pipeline. So you, you roughly sped up the throughput by 32x compared to before, even though the latency hasn't improved. And in fact, it's maybe got a little bit worse. But um, that's what this is one of the primary ways that you increase the throughput of circuits is by pipelining them and this is the simple form of pipelining which covers i would say like 99 percent of pipelining outside of cpus is combinational pipelining where everything is feed forward um, so that's basically how you do that you start with a combinational circuit typically and then you insert these you know, I'm calling them register slices, that's a common term, but basically these delay registers at various natural um, cuts through the circuit. In this case, we have this big iteration, so this is the natural place to insert it, but um, you can insert it in a bunch of, you know, wherever it makes sense. Uh, and typically you want to have the slices uh, spaced out so that each inter-slice delay is roughly balanced. So, um, if, if there is a critical path, if, if, if in this case it's very homogeneous, each of the slices does a similar kind of thing, but if you're dealing with a more heterogeneous circuit, um, you may have to slice some portions of it even more finely in order to reach your clock rate target goal. Um, because ultimately your clock rate is going to be dependent on the slowest path from a register to a register. And so you can slice it more finely up to a certain point in order to increase throughput. Of course, it doesn't help with latency, um, and in the case of CPU pipelining, instruction pipelining, as it's called, um, the the problem is it's not a pure feedforward scenario. It's a sequential semantic you're trying to implement with pipelining, and so you have to worry about all these pipeline hazards. Uh, you have to do you know speculative. You have to you have to predict uh, the instruction you're going to execute before you know for sure, and so you have all these kinds of issues to deal with. It becomes very complicated. We'll deal with it later. 
uh, when we get to CPU design. But um, for now, we're kind of going to be staying in this world of combinational pipelining, uh, which is very close to combinational logic, but with these delay registers uh, inserted. So anyway, um, let me see. Is there another pipeline circuit I wanted to demonstrate before we do another thing? Maybe something from something from earlier that would be could be pipelined in some interesting way. I mean, I could show you some simple examples. Uh, like normally, you don't want, like I said, you don't want to make your register slices be too thin in the sense that you want there to be a substantial amount of logic between two slices, you know, two consecutive slices of the registers. Um, but, you know, in theory, you could even do crazy stuff like pipelining. Well, certainly, suppose you wanted to do a really long carry propagate adder. Like, suppose you wanted to add 1024 bit numbers or something like that. This is a little bit of a hypothetical example, but things like this do crop up, right? Suppose you wanted to add really, really big numbers. Um, in general, you try to avoid doing that by using things like carry save uh, adders, which have constant time uh, propagation. But sometimes you really do need to do a carry propagate addition. And we know that even if we pull out all the stops for that, it's going to be logarithmic depth. And so for something, you know, um, you can get up to quite big sizes. It doesn't grow too much, but maybe eventually it's too wide. And you want to pipeline it in order to meet your um, your clock rate uh, and throughput requirements. And so one thing you can do is you can actually, and this is the extreme case. Let me show you bit wide, like bit level pipelining, which is not a good idea because the overhead of pipelining basically dominates. Mm -hmm. But um, suppose you wanted to do a pipeline adder, you could do the following. Remember the this would be a pipeline ripple carry adder. So maybe let me write that. And again, you wouldn't do exactly this in practice, but um, this is an extreme illustration of, of very fine-grained pipelining. So um, you know that we have a running, well, let's say we have a, a single bit carry externally. It's convenient to provide that. Um, so then what we'll do is we will iterate over, um, this is also a case of how if you use this delay operator a little too liberally, you can end up creating too many pipeline registers, but fortunately because of the way we work, um, they won't be included in the final design if there's no dependency on them. But um, let's see here. Um, normally if we wanted to write, let me just remind you how, if we want to do this combinationally, we've done this uh, I think several times now, but let me just show you. Uh, what we do is we have some kind of output, which we'll just store in a list. Um, and we do something like this, uh, x i y i c, actually I guess we'll do it like this, we have add 3, so we do x i y i c, and then s depend s i, and then finally we return s, we don't have to return c, let's just say. So, um, so this is the you know the, the the full adder, the three to two compressor. We've seen this a million times now. So, what 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 if you wanted to actually do some crazy bit level register slicing for pipelining? Um, you could do basically the following. And this might be this. this well, actually, maybe this is not a good example because you kind of want, with pipeline, you kind of want to output. Maybe it won't work. Let me try it. Maybe this will not be such a good example. Um, Yeah, I think it's not going to be a great example. It's actually more complex than uh, than, than something I'm ready to demonstrate at this point. It's not super hard, but you have to delay the entire vector, or at least the, the part of the vector you haven't gotten to yet. Um, 
so you would have to rewrite it in a slightly different form than what we've done previously, like um, It's a pretty weird way of writing it. Um, yeah, let's let's not do that right now. But anyway, it can be done. Um, you have to basically do the same thing you're doing before, where uh, you try to write it more or less in this form, I think, and then you have to you end up doing something like this. Oops. Actually, let me let me see if I can get it to work. Uh, it shouldn't be such a scaredy cat, but. Um, something like this if you write it in this form which is basically what we were doing before but here we're kind of slicing off um, I guess you could also write it recursively this way which might appeal to some people but anyway it becomes something more like this um, and then you're building up this s so I think if you do this here um, you would have a similar structure, but at every point you would uh, this is maybe too complex to show, but let me see if I can get it to work. Um, X, Y. C S I C so slice one vector, slice the other vector as well. And then we add add three of this. Yeah, let's abandon this. This is going to be a little bit more complicated because you have to carry around sort of the finished output from all the previous lower bits, which becomes a quadratic amount of stuff. So this is actually not a good candidate for the style now that I think about it. Yeah, never mind that. Um, all right, maybe that's it for the mainstream. Um, we covered pipelining. Uh, we had this, what was it? fix some bugs uh, in the compiler and, and in our code, um, demonstrated how to test a pipeline system using multiple concurrent tasks. Uh, and um, that's a good start for, pipe, for combinational pipelining, I think. Uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to stop recording the stream and then I'm going to um, maybe uh, just hang out for a few minutes on the stream, then start re-recording another stream on a totally different topic, still related to circuits and stateful circuits and stuff like that. Actually, maybe I won't. I actually need to go get food. So maybe I'll do another stream later. But anyway, so that's it for today. Uh, expect more streams, I guess, tomorrow and uh, in other days. So uh, see you around.